Some mm-hmm. people grow older. Some people grow up. <laughs> at 23... I love that. I got to say, I love that. <laughs> at 23 is when I felt like I started to grow up. Mm-hmm. Uh, I used to be very negative. I used to blame everyone for my circumstances. The court screwed me. It wasn't my fault that I was in here. It was around the age of 23 where I was able to look in the mirror and say, you know what? The only person responsible for where you are is you. There are processes and there is redemption when you rise up from a very, very bad situation. That is the subject of today's podcast on the Bo Knows Who is Changing the World to be expanded today to the Bo Knows Who Wants to Change the World and who has every determination to do that. I am sitting here with Curtis Brooks, who is the Business Development Specialist at the Tech Valley Shuttle based in Cohoes, New York. We're not really going to talk a lot about the shuttle today, more of Curtis's backstory and how he got to where he is today based on what's happened to him in his past. I hope that was a good intro, Curtis. That was a good intro. (laughs) Better than I could have come up with. So, uh, how long have you been with Tech Valley Shuttle and Cohoes? I'm here just over two months now. And you're the business development specialist. And it is your it is your job your 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 duty I guess here to get business for the Tech Valley Shuttle and I guess that's worked out okay so far for you. So far, um, everyone seems to be happy with the job that I'm doing. Good, good. Well, you look the part too. <laughs> I try. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mentioned uh, early on um, in the intro about a backstory. Now um, I know it involves some incarceration, yes. right? Yes. Um, um, you can go into as much detail as you want or don't want to, but um, you were you were in for quite a while. How long yes. for? Uh, I was incarcerated for 24 years. Okay, without going into all the details, that's quite a long time. I mean, you had a lot of time to to, to think about yes about your life really, and and not having freedom. But when it came, I'm not going to dwell on what happened there. We're going to kind of go into where you are now and how you you got to that point once you when, when you knew you were getting out in fact the day you got out what was the thought the day that you were finally free and what you were going to do with let's say the rest of your life um to answer that i kind of have to give a little bit of a uh insight into my thought processes as it led to me getting out okay um, all right so i was a juvenile offender i went to prison when i was 15. um the laws changed with the supreme court which provided another opportunity for people. So I was on the road to getting out for about two years before um, I was granted clemency by the governor. I received it in November of 2018 and was released in July of 2019. Mm -hmm. And my thought process during that time of waiting and finally knowing was just really preparing myself. I was actually surprised that the level of excitement, exuberance wasn't there. It was more getting ready for an opportunity that I really never felt like I had a chance to live. Um, So when the day came and I was released at the gates, I remember I celebrated with the people that were there to welcome me back, which was, you know, my defense team. Um, A great woman in Senator Joanne C. Benson from Maryland. it was really just, it's, it's time. Mm-hmm. It was a matter of fact sense that this is my opportunity and I'm absolutely going to make the best of it. Okay. So, uh, did you have any idea what you wanted to do when you got no. out? <laughs> Not a clue. I knew that I wanted to definitely take the circumstances that I had dealt with my story and do community service, give back, try to reach kids, Mm -hmm. um, try to be what I never had, which is someone that would be willing to talk to kids Mm -hmm. instead of talk at them. Yeah. I think that's a very key thing in being able to reach them as far as career. No, I had no idea what I wanted to do. So what did you do that first, those first few months, say that first year or so after you got out? When I came home, um, I was basically given, uh, a rest time. 
to reacclimate myself, but I was immediately employed with a nonprofit in Maryland, okay. which was partnered with three of the most underdeveloped, underperforming elementary schools in the area. Mm -hmm. I was the program coordinator responsible with helping coordinate tutoring services that they were doing and implementing more services going into the elementary school. Mm -hmm. uh, I did that until COVID hit, at which time I started doing contact tracing. Okay. Contact tracing. Yeah. What is that? I was the person that would call you after you knew that you had COVID and told you that you had to sit in your house for a prescribed amount of time. Oh. <laughs> but really, it, I looked at it again as a chance to do something to make a difference. Make a difference. I didn't look at it as, you know, telling people, you know, that you had to just isolate yourself. Just trying to do what we could to curb the spread. In that year or so before you got out of, of being incarcerated, you already had some idea that you wanted, of course, that you wanted to help kids. You wanted to give back. Yes. We're, we're, and, and, and that's what you went and did. Um, and you were telling me just earlier today, as a, uh, today of the recording, that you're going to be speaking at a school. Let's fast forward a little bit. I'm in line. You're in um, line. Okay. I, I had a conversation. I've had a previous conversation with the uh, chief of police of Cohoes. Okay. Uh, and we spoke yesterday. Um, I we're trying to set up a meeting with a local, I believe, high school. Uh, the principal is very eager to have me come in and do speaking with the kids there. Um, we're okay. looking to try to set that up for next week to see if we can go forward with me being able to go in and try to connect with some of the kids. Oh, okay. Uh, even the time you were in, uh, you, were 20, you said 24 years. So a couple, two, three, four years into that, you might have been by then thinking about a different path than the one you had taken to get yourself there, I'm sure. And that would involve helping. I mean, what's the, do you, what's the earliest recollection you have of your, your thought process is wanting to help kids. My earliest would be the age of 23, mm -hmm. um, which is really a benchmark age for me. Okay, um, why, why is that? Why is it benchmark? What I tell people is that I believe that there are two paths that people take. Some mm -hmm. people grow older, some people grow up. <laughs> At 23... I love that. I gotta say I love that. <laughs> At 23 is when I felt like I started to grow up. Mm -hmm. Uh, I used to be very negative. I used to blame everyone for my circumstances. The court screwed me. It wasn't my fault that I was in here. It was around the age of 23 where I was able to look in the mirror and say, you know what? The only person responsible for where you are is you. Yeah. Being able to take accountability to recognize that I now had a debt. However people try to term it, some people try to, I don't want to say downplay it, but maybe ease the burden that I should feel because of the circumstances. To me, I had a debt. Mm -hmm. uh, I allowed myself to be in a situation where I consider it weakness. I was too weak to be able to make the right decision at that time. And if I had made the right decision, circumstances might have played out a lot differently. Because I let that moment go and failed to do right, I felt like I had a debt to do right to try to make up for it, to basically redeem redeem, uh, redeem myself. So it's about redemption? In many ways, yes. Um, it's about remembrance, redemption. Um, I felt like, and I've expressed it many times, and I did so in the episode where I recorded for A&E, I felt like if I had walked out of the gates and just been an idiot, Mm. doing dumb things, it would have made an entire waste of the time that I had spent, the entire opportunity that I had to learn from my mistakes, and that would have been the biggest waste. Okay. When you got out, you were doing some kind of, you were working for the contact tracing, you were doing that. Yes. Um, let's, do, let's do a timeline, maybe, from, from the contact tracing up till your employment with the Tech Valley Shuttle? So just to, I can do the entire timeline. From July 2019 until roughly April 2020, I was working for the 
Prince George, the then Prince George's County Education Coalition. Uh, during that period, I had a chance to intern with a top lobbying firm in the state, so I have a little bit of experience with that. Then COVID hit. Mm -hmm. um, I was still employed with the Education Coalition, but unable to go in okay. because of the circumstances. And in June of 2020, I believe it was, I started uh, contact tracing. And I did that uh, until they basically put the money and decided to put the funding into the vaccinations rather than contact tracing, mm -hmm. at which time the bulk of the contact tracers were let go. Yeah. From that point, I it was around the time that I met my wife, mm -hmm. who was from New York, and it started the process of moving out here. I just got married in August. We bought our first house. Thank you. Um, and here I was working at Latham Pools, mm -hmm. um, the manufacturing warehouse, for uh, just a short period before I was put in contact with Trent. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Trent. Trent being the owner and of, proprietor of the Tech Valley yes. Show, who I met virtually anyway a year ago. <laughs> nice guy. And tell, what was that conversation like with Trent to get you into here? I actually didn't reach out to Trent right away. Um, he was a person that I was, I was given his contact number, uh -huh. but in the name is Tech Valley Shuttle, and I looked at it and it was clearly as a you know driving opportunity, and I don't yet have my license. Oh. Uh, I'm in the process of that, uh, so I didn't reach out to him right away. But when I did, we talked, and I just <clears throat> expressed to him that I was looking for an opportunity, right. um, really anything, even if it meant scrubbing toilets, mm -hmm. um, and he told me that they had an opening for their business development specialist uh, position and that he would allow me the opportunity to interview for that. And that's where it went and you're here. I apparently made a very good impression <laughs> um, and, and managed to get this, the, the job, yes. And how many, uh, in, your, in your two months, I think, I don't know if we mentioned this earlier, in your two months you've, you've managed to make some contacts? And this week made two months, yeah. Oh. And you, but uh, has, how's the momentum been since you started? That first day must have been like, okay, what do I do? Uh, first day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about your my, first day. My first period was very much, I don't come from a sales background. Yeah. Um, so to be thrust into the situation where it's go out and get contracts. Um, mm -hmm. And it's not just, just, you know, the aspect of let's go find contracts. It's mm -hmm. we're very much a community based organization. So it's also about let's find the opportunities where we can be of assistance. So to, to give me that and, and say, well, here are your tools, go, go build a house. I'm like, well, I don't, I don't, I don't know what the house looks like and I don't know how these tools work. Did Trent give you some guidance in this in this the, area? The uh, Trent and and Chris, the Chris, CEO yeah. of the company, have been very good at being patient um, and taking the time to provide me with the guidance that I need. Uh, I am just also a very ambitious and driven person. You saw, yes, I can. can tell. <laughs> and you know, babies go through their crawling then walking and then running phase and I basically try to go from a crawl to a sprint. <laughs> oh. Well I think you'll do well. Right? Based on based on your your articulation for one, how you speak, how you talk, how you present yourself, all of that I think you'll do well. That's just uh, an opinion from from me, but I think you'll do I well. I appreciate it. Uh, what is the message? You want to you mentioned earlier bringing messages to kids. What is the message you want to bring to kids? My message is multifaceted. Uh, first, it's very much to be aware. Mm -hmm. We live in a, in a culture that is very much driven with the fit in mentality, especially oh, yeah. at a very young age. Yes, it is. So it is almost encouraged in many situations to sacrifice yourself, your own feelings, your own belief to go along with the crowd, to yeah. fit in, to be accepted. Those are dangerous moments because then you sacrificing of yourself to make mm -hmm. someone else happy can lead you to being eternally unhappy oh, yeah. in the long and, run. And the older you get, the worse <laughs> that gets. So that's a very big message that I want to deliver to kids is being able to follow your heart, mm -hmm. being able to follow your feelings and not saying that I'm going to put someone else's feelings first. 
The other is we live in a very condemning, and it's conditional, it's, it's not a blanket, but we do live in a very condemning society where there are so many people that will look at someone who has made a mistake and say, you're eternally cursed because you've made that mistake. Yeah. Kids feel that. Kids feed off of that. And I'm I'm working also to go speak at kids. I want to say that the organization is called Berkshire, mm -hmm. um, where they deal with kids that are basically a step away from prison. Ooh. And they're helping to try to reclaim these kids and set them on a different path. And something that these kids will express is, I've made this mistake. My mm -hmm. life is over. Because they feel the condemnation that comes from other people, from people looking down at them. And it is the message that I want to deliver that just because you make a mistake, it does not mean that you can't come back from it. You did. I am still coming back from it. I I mean, it's, 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 it's never really an end. There's no end to the process of coming back. There is isn't. Um, people, you'll hear a lot of people who come out of prison who will say, I'm just trying to show everyone that I'm just like them. Mm -hmm. And in part, to me, that sounds like a prisoner thing to say. I'm just here to be me. People will see me for who I am and will be able to judge me for who I am. But I'm just here to live my life, to be me, to grow, be happy, have family, and everything else. Your story is compelling, which is why I'm down here recording it with you right now. But I want to formally invite you back to come again, to come on the show again, uh, six months from now, whatever, whenever there's been a milestone or if you're... If you've spoken to uh, some kids and, and, and whatever, well, I'll, I'm going to have you on again and uh, we'll tell some more stories because we're out of time right now. Oh, that's terrible. You told me you had two questions for me. I do. Oh, I do. Uh, but I was, I, I was coming to them. <laughs> but this is, the form, this is the end of the, I'm just segmenting there. I'll edit all that out. What's your favorite movie? The Last Samurai. Tell us why. It is very much a, I mean, it's a rehash story. Everybody knows that. It's basically dances with wolves with swords. <laughs> um, but I, I, one, I'm a person that's very much enamored by the way societies used to be, where honor, dignity, that type of thing, mm -hmm. was your driving factor rather than cars, money, <laughs> women, you know. Um, but the story about how one person can follow their heart and say that even though this is the path that I came from, mm -hmm. I see something special in this path. And I'm going to sacrifice all to follow my heart and give myself wholly to this purpose. That's a very profound thing. To it is. Great movie. Great choice. If you had a time machine and you could go back in time and speak to somebody who you consider to be a mentor, somebody who's not with us anymore, who might you go back and want to have coffee with or talk to? Rene Descartes. And why is that? Rene Descartes, when I started studying philosophy, was a person that I really felt like offered thoughts that were eye-opening to me. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that I agreed with everything that he said, mm -hmm. but there was some very... And I had read stuff like Hume and so many, so many others, but... Uh, even getting into the aspects of his cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, mm -hmm. was so profound in the thoughts that it invoked in me. It created a hunger for me to try to understand more about life and existence and who we are and what we're here meant to do. Perfect. I'd like to talk to him a little before he went crazy. Yeah, you got to get the right time. <laughs> Make a good sci-fi movie. You still pollute the timeline. I always talk about stuff like that. Curtis Brooks, the business development specialist at the Tech Valley Shuttle. It has been a pleasure to speak with you. And I'm going to hear you again. It's been an honor to be here. Live long. I, I can get you one. And, and prosper. prosper. Yes. Yeah, look at that. <laughs> He's good. <laughs>